Hello everyone, myself Sabasachi Mukhopadhyay. I always deal with data. I play around with data. Whenever people ask me what you do, I say them that I play around with data. Now you know that today's world is the data-driven world, you see. And as we always say, data is a new oil. But what is the essence behind that? And now, what is the idea I want to give you? Like what we can explore our data in the quantum domain. And obviously, along with that, I want to highlight that whatever the progress we have made to make the full utilization of the data in the quantum domain. So before we start, I want to give one, one idea that why we call that data-driven approach is superior. Because in earlier, if you see, whether in the study of technology or whether in the study of management, we used to go for the qualitative approach. So what was that approach? We used to collect data through people's opinion. We sometimes call it as the market research. For example, if you go visit, visit some location, you are taking opinion of 20 people. Whether Colgate or Pestudent, which one is better? People will share their opinion. You will prepare your data according to that, and you will upload the data in database according to that. And another one is quite a better approach was to take about the expert opinion that was the Delphi method. But the problem with both of the approach, what we call the qualitative approach, was that at the end of the day, we are human being. Whether you are taking the opinion of general audience or whether you are taking the opinion of the expert, the problem is lying with that there will be certain sort of biasness according to our choice. Even we are the expert, at the end of the day, we are human being, and our biasness will be there, whatever the opinion we will make. So how to make a data-driven approach in order to overcome that sort of the biasness? So fortunately, we are in the industry 4.0 era, and you can see we are connected with the sensors all around us. So we are being able to collect the real-time data. So that's the beauty of the data-driven approach, that whenever we are coming back to the quantitative approach, we have the options like exploring time series data, exploring different econometric model to make a proper predictions, whether we are talking about the stock market predictions, whether we are talking about the healthcare domain, early stage disease diagnosis, whether we are talking about the space weather predictions. So it's all about data in all around, in various domain, right from the agriculture to space science to healthcare, in every domain. But if we look back, in 1960s, how the culture along with the computer science has evolved in our India. In 1963, if I'm not wrong, in IIT Kanpur, they have established their first computer science department, and gradually they have explored in various domains of the computer science. So one of those, their most prominent approach was to tackle the database. So you can understand that the database is, is, is like a container of the data, right? So whenever it started from 1960s, it was all about the flat file-based approach. And then 1970, if we look around, that we used to store data in a tabular format. So the concept of RDBMS, what we call Relational Database Management, along with SQL concept, started to evolve around. Then in 1990s, we gradually, by, by following up the hierarchical model, network model, and object-oriented model, we, whenever the advent of the worldwide wave happened in 1994, so gradually we started to deal with HTTP. So the big data, what we talk about, uh, the concept has evolved around in 1990s. So in generally, we call it as the big data phase one, which is being fully dominated by RDBMS. Flat file followed by RDBMS. But then, after the advent of World Wide Wave, we started to talk about the HTTP. We are started exploring Google search. So basically, we are gradually moved around to Big Data Phase 2.0. But remember that due to the arrival of the social media, in 2004 onwards, in 2004 Facebook, then gradually Orkut was 
gained popularity for a very smaller amount of time, but it gradually demolished due to the popularity of Facebook. And then you can see, apart from the social media, there are, there are professional media like LinkedIn, and obviously the, tw the, tw the, the so much popularity of Twitter, which generated huge amount of the unstructured data. So now, whenever I am talking about the concepts like unstructured, semi-structured, or, semi, or, or, or for example, uh, the structured data, let me clarify that whenever we are talking about the tabular format approach, so that is basically can be dealt with the structured data set. But whenever we are talking about posting videos, posting images, so, or, or, or for example, posting audio files, so the, that is basically an example of the unstructured data. But if you look at the statistics, by 2020, it's almost mostly 80% data, whatever we deal with is the semi-structured data, which is a good combination of the structured and unstructured part. So for example, you are sending an email or you are, whenever you are posting, uh, 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 doing a Facebook post, so what is happening there, your activity time, login time, logout time, and total activity time is being stored in the tabular format. So that is the structured part. But whenever you are posting some images or uploading videos, so that part is the unstructured part. So in a combination of that, you are generating a huge amount of the semi-structured data. So because of the generation of generating of the semi-structured data, what is happening there, that you have to face the velocity problem. What is that velocity problem? Now, whenever we talk about big data, so we do not put any threshold about the size of the data. We do not call that this petabyte will be considered as average size data, this terabyte will be considered as big data. We do not say like that. Rather, we quantify them on the features of 3V, volume, velocity, and variety. So as I am saying that, that if you look at the database as per the report of ICT, that there is an exponential growth in the database, day by day. So whatever the data in today's data you are capturing, after 10 days, 10 days from, from today, you will feel that, oh my God, that was nothing in front of whatever the data volume we are facing today because of the exponential growth in the digital database. So one is the one problem you can, you can see there is a huge volume. Second problem you can experience that the huge velocity because of the exponential growth in the database. And the third one already we have covered up, the variety of the data types. Because nowadays we are not only tackling with the structural data, but in the big data, big data phase 3.0, we are also tackling with the unstructured and more precisely, it's all about the semi-structured data, okay? So due to that, you can understand that why there should be so much popularity of the no SQL based approaches. There are so many job demands you can see around the MongoDB, Cassandra, people are looking after that, and along with that, graph database. For example, just I'm giving you, giving you a novice idea, such that those, those who are not expert in the field, they can easily relate with that. Whenever, whether you are, you are doing Facebook or LinkedIn, you may see that whether you are in a friend list or not, you always see some mutual, mutual connections. We have mutual connection of 330, 333 friends, or 100 friends or something like that. So that can be done by the applications of the graph database, okay? So that is the reason that the graph database has, has opened, up, it opened, up a, opened up a new space for the big data. So we have understood that how we have made the quantitative approach so much robust through till now a date with, with giving the alternative solution in terms of database shortcomings also because schema-less database gives you the versatility to overcome the RDBMS limitations to tackle with this type of unstructured or semi-structured data. But the problem, what I am saying, that whenever we are doing certain computations, we always re rely on the some sort of supports like nowadays GPUs. But imagine the era whenever the machine learning algorithm evolves around. So basically from 90s, people explored out the concept of the neural network. Then in 1990, support vector machine got the huge popularity by which was invented by Bhapnik. And then gradually, we, we come across the more robust kind of uh, 
uh, activation function because earlier it was all about the sigmoid function or tan hyperbolic function. But if you see what is the vision behind the machine learning algorithm, it's all about to mimicking human activity. Now, whenever you are mimicking human activity, you can understand if you relate the philosophy with those tan, tan hyperbolic or sigmoid function, if you can remember the graph, is that it's all about giving you this scalability at a certain extent, then saturation. Like the way we, we, we work daily basis. If you think that we can work per day, 12 hours, 16 hours in a continuous mode, but then what will happen? Then we will become tired, our performance will get saturated. In a similar manner, if you look at the curve of the tan hyperbolic or sigmoid function, those are the activation function in the machine learning domain, their performance also saturate up to a certain extent. As per the experts, the data, the data in order of 10 to the power 5 when you proceed, the performance saturates. So that's the, that's the threshold of exploring out the deep learning algorithms. We nowadays talk about CNN, convolutional neural network, is one of those, have those kind of capability because here we are exploring out this, the activation function which has, a, which, has a, which has a huge potential like ReLU, which, has a, which is a continuous scalability curve. And that's the reason in real world applications you can see there are so much explorations of the deep learning algorithms. But when the theory developed, people, nobody has thought that it will be practically deployable because we don't have processor power. Because this is the angle of the processor power. We don't have that much of the processor power. So once NVIDIA came up with TPU, Tensor Processor Processing Unit, uh, sorry, uh, Graphical Processing Unit, and then Google came up with TPU in 2016, Tensor Processing Unit. So then we get that type of the capability that we can explore out the deep learning algorithm in a practical applications. So now we are looking after the three, three aspects. One is the real-time predictions, second one is the low-cost approach, and third one is the cloud-based approach. But you know that whenever you are storing data in cloud and you are doing the real-time predictions, there are sometimes due to congestion, we face latency. Now you can understand that whenever you are doing the e-commerce transactions, you are making the we were predicting the credit, credit card for transactions in real time or some financial transaction for in real time or you were predicting, uh, exploring out it in the healthcare domain and predicting the cancer, uh, early stage cancer in real time. You can understand latency can hamper your effort. So that's the reason we, we always prefer some sort of the solutions, alternative solutions that is edge computing based approach. For example, smartphone based early stage disease detection where definitely we will not get the processor power support, what we get is by exploring out the GPUs. But what happens if we can deal, uh, if we can tweak the algorithms in a such a smart manner in order to reduce the time complexity? That can, that can help you to process those algorithms in your low processor devices like smartphone. And one of those applications has been made by us in our research group which I have earlier, explore, earlier mentioned in my first TEDx talk, that we have built a one type of the medical tricorder kind of stuffs, which can actually give you, generate the report of the, whether you are facing the diabetic retinopathy, which is a major cause of vision loss, or whether you are facing the, um, uh, the skin cancer, oral cancer kind of stuffs, which can be detected through an early stage, and definitely it will generate the report within few minutes. But as I am mentioning that the world is gradually moving around towards the quantum domain and trying to figure out the quantum domain potential. But what is the reason behind that? So basically, if you see that whenever, uh, as, as, I'm, as I'm saying that, the digital world is getting doubled day by day. And due to that, according to the expert, by 2035, all of our processor, processor power will be saturated whether it is GPU or, or it is TPU, everyone will saturate. So it will be a saturation zone as per the Moore's law. So you can understand that it is a high time to shift towards the quantum domain, explore out the potential of the quantum computers, such that we can avoid that part and we can obviously gain the optimum accuracy, not only the optimum accuracy, but we can also utilize the security aspects at a supreme level. So basically what happens, quantum, you all you know that the quantum has one of the uh, one amazing phenomena of the entanglement, which can give you the humongous amount of the parallel processing power 
along with the supreme security. So basically, what happens that whatever the quantum computer so far has been made, that is that has a problem related to noise. This is because that, that is a highly noisy system and bulky system. So that's the reason nowadays what we are doing, we are processing towards the cloud-based approach. So in the cloud-based approach, there are options like you have IBM Q experience, IBM quantum experience. Along with that, you can also explore out the TensorFlow quantum because those who are from the engineering background, you are quite aware of the TensorFlow that we, Google has, has invented whenever they have invented the TensorFlow. We have the lot of uh, machine learning APIs are available there. You can explore out for the, uh, for the lot of application purpose. And TensorFlow Quantum is also nothing, uh, also has been developed to explore out the potential of the quantum paradigm in a, in, a in a supreme level along with the highest amount of this simulator support like we do for the IBM Quantum experience. So what we are doing now as a research group, we are converting all of our classical approaches in the quantum, in a parallel of the, in a parallel of the quantum paradigm. So what we are doing, we are basically, for example, principal component analysis. So we are, we are trying to explore the potential of the quantum principal component analysis or in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a parallel tally with support vector machine, we are exploring out the potential of the quantum support vector machine. So as for our observation, I just want to share with you the work has been communicated in a SCI journal. So basically, we have made a hybridized combination approach through the quantum PCA, which is being used for the feature extraction purpose, followed by the classification has been done by the quantum support vector machine purpose. So once we have standardized or validated our result along with the MNIST data set, which has been considered as the standard, gold standard for the validation of any algorithm, which is a basically a collection of the hand digits from zero to nine, so basically, where we have trained it for the 60,000 images and 10,000 images has been done for the testing purpose, you know that classically we can achieve at most 98% accuracy. That is, a, that is really good. With quantum applications in quantum framework, we get the accuracy just above, slightly above the 98%, that was 98.3%. So it is a comparable case. And, and, and in other data set, we have also seen that that it is, giving a, it is a giving a very much similar classification accuracy in terms of the classic, classical algorithms. But then you will ask that what is the benefit? But the benefit comes around in terms of the time complexity. You remember that whenever we are doing certain, dealing with certain classification problems in data-driven world, it's not only about the accuracy, but it's also about the time complexity. And quantum algorithms works exponentially faster than those classical algorithms. And that is the beauty. And in near future, we can see that we will have the lot of potentials of those quantum algorithms by applying them on the real world data sets, by exploring them out in a summit level. So you can imagine that we are getting gradually prepared for the 2035 era, where our all the processor, classical processors will be saturated and will require in both ways, either in quantum simulator way best approach, physical simulator based approach, or in the cloud-based approach. So gradually we are moving towards that. Remember, the thing I want to highlight in a mostly manner that across the globe, there are more than 80% people under the bottom of pyramid category. And in India, it is more than 96% people. That means this 96% people do not have enough money to pay tax. So you can understand that whatever may be our professions, we can be entrepreneurs, we can be professors, we can be scientists, we can be engineers. It is our duty to provide optimum solutions such that which can be benefited in human life, whether it is in agricultural domain or in healthcare domain or it can be some other extent. But it is our duty to make science and technology towards the beneficiary purpose of human life. It should be blessings to human life, not the cars. So in this way, I want to thank all of you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.